Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Restore live stream. Uh, I, I was just uh, reflecting on the fact I think this is five in a row that I've done. So um, maybe an overdose of Ian and congratulations if you're still here and still watching. Um, we're kicking off a brand new series today that I'll introduce in a few minutes. Um, but just to say we had an amazing weekend last weekend uh, celebrating 40 years of a vineyard church uh, that, that went on to become uh, Restore Community Church. And it was lovely, actually, if you were there on the Saturday um, with uh, a number of folk from the history of Vineyard Stroke Restore. Robert Anderson did an amazing job putting together uh, three 15 minute videos, really telling the history of the last 40 years in three sections. Um, and uh, it was amazing, actually. I, I think one of the most powerful things was we uh, gave some opportunity for people just to share um, some of their recollections, I guess, and uh, what actually happened was a number of people just talked about how Jesus has impacted and changed uh, their lives over the last 40 years, and, and it, was, it was a really precious, really special time, actually, and uh, I, I think often in life we don't have good marker moments. Uh, normally, certainly if you're anything like me, always thinking about what's coming next, always thinking about what's uh, next week going to bring, what have I got to prepare and get ready for that. And sometimes I just don't take the time to stop and pause and look back and be thankful and grateful. I guess that's why God put the Sabbath principle into life, isn't it? That there will be one day every week where we would stop, look back and just reflect. And in those moments, be able to celebrate all that God has done, um, as well as sometimes uh, maybe reflect on areas where we still need God to continue to work in our lives. But for me, that 40th weekend was, was an amazing, amazing thing. And on the Restore YouTube channel, we have um, those three videos and they're well, well worth uh, watching. And if you're connected still to people who've been part of uh, Restore through the years, it might be good to send the links to them as well so they can just enjoy uh, reminding one another of all the good that God has done. And so it's going to be interesting, actually, as we step into the next season. I think uh, Restore began 40 years ago because there was a move of the Holy Spirit. And that move of the Holy Spirit birthed something new. If you watch the videos, you'll see it wasn't entirely intentional. Uh, nobody ever really intended to plant a church. Um, God's just moved and uh, people started to gather and out of that sprung a church. And there is a real sense that God is moving in this nation at this time. I've done more traveling this year than I've done, I uh, think, ever before. And, uh, and we've also had more people visit uh, Restore and input our team than ever before. But one of the common messages that we've seen wherever we go is that the Holy Spirit is on the move. And so I'm really excited to see what God is going to birth in this next season and uh, what he's going to lead us into. Um, as I said, we're kicking off a brand new series today and we've called this series Messy Church. Now, there is a, uh, a whole initiative in the UK called Messy Church and it's kind of church for toddlers. And so uh, you take a theme from the Bible or maybe a story of Jesus and uh, you put a, a whole activity together, like maybe an hours program, something like that. And there's crafts you can do, there's story, there's a messy plate. And they just call it Messy Church. So um, there's lots of interaction, lots of, of fun and those kind of things. So we picked up that label, but this isn't church for toddlers and, and, uh, and preschoolers. You'll be pleased to know if you're watching it. Uh, we picked up the label um, really because... And this is something that, uh, that kind of connects to our 40 years, really. Um, sometimes church can be really messy and sometimes church can be really tough. And uh, like I say, we produce three videos that, uh, that on the whole cover the highlights of the last 40 years because um, they're the things that are easy to talk, to talk about and we've got footage of and all of those kind of things. But the reality is 40 years in any church, there will be highlights, there will also be lowlights, there will also be things that have been challenges and uh, um, for many people th there'll even be people that aren't around anymore because they've got hurt or wounded down through the years and church can be messy because life is messy and, uh, and people are people and uh, just because uh, you join a church doesn't mean that suddenly everything's going to be miraculous and perfect and everybody's going to behave in a, in, in a way that's just like Jesus. It's not like you come into a room with 40 people in and you've got 40 mini versions of Jesus and it's like heaven on earth. Hopefully you've got 40 people that are wanting to learn more about Jesus and aspiring to become more like him. But the reality is we're all work in progress and, uh, and all of us have got our flaws and our downsides. Me 
as much as anybody else. And uh, one of the things we did on the evening of our uh, 40th celebration was just spend some time just repenting of all the things that we've got wrong and saying sorry uh, to, to God for all the things we've got wrong over the last 40 years. Um, because that's one of the ways we grow as well, by owning our stuff and navigating our way forward. And so over the next um, seven, eight weeks, we're going to be looking at the book of 1 Corinthians in the Bible. What I love about the Bible is the Bible has a great relevance into our everyday life. And um, uh, you can normally find somewhere in the Bible, you can find some stories that, uh, that uh, give you insight into situations that you're grappling with or that are occurring in contemporary society. And uh, uh, such, was, such is the issue of, uh, that Paul addresses in the book of 1 Corinthians. So just to give you a bit of a background to it, that might help you. Um, Corinth was a big Gentile city. So uh, it wasn't naturally uh, Jewish, wasn't naturally uh, followers of God. And it was a, a prosperous uh, port and economic centre. But also the city of Corinth had a reputation for immorality and, uh, and idolatry and, uh, and, and degradation. I can't even say it, can I? Degradation on a, on a, on, on a high level. And so it really was, uh, it really was a mis mix, mishmash of cultures and uh, all sorts, and, and kind of anything went in Corinth. And uh, the Apostle Paul, on his second missionary journey, we find this in Acts chapter 18, um, he went to the Gentile world and, and to a number of these big cities, and uh, went there, told people about Jesus, and ultimately established churches there. And uh, Corinth was one of those places where he went, and uh, there was a, a move of God, a work of the Spirit, and, and a church was formed. And then Paul went on and he went to the city of Ephesus. Uh, you might know that. There's uh, the book of Ephesians written to, this, uh, to the church in Ephesus. And then Paul returned uh, back to Jerusalem. Then a little while later, he went on his third missionary journey. And when he went on his third missionary journey, he revisited Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is about 180 miles away from Corinth, uh, just a, a bit further along uh, the seashore. And uh, he then spent three years at Ephesus inputting the church there. But midway through that time, he received report after report after report that the church in Corinth was really not doing well and was in a mess. And part of that report was there was a huge amount of, uh, of, of not good stuff going on. There was uh, uh, sexual immorality huge, on a huge scale, not just you know, one person sleeping with someone they shouldn't, like, like, like openly brazen uh, sexual immorality. We'll talk about that in a, in a couple of weeks' time, but you're looking forward to that one. Um, there were people um, that were falling out with one another and taking one another to court to try and resolve disputes. There was all sorts of mess going on in the church of Corinth. And so Paul wrote a letter to, uh, to the church there to appeal to them and give them some instructions how they might be able to address some of these issues and sort themselves out so they could be a, representation, a better representation of Jesus to their city and to the world around them. I'm just going to read the first uh, nine verses of, of uh, 1 Corinthians because it gives a bit of a, a uh, context uh, into that and a little bit of a flavour of the letter. It says this, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, called to, be apostle, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. So notice right from the very beginning, Paul talks about as a church, as God's people, we're called to be sanctified, which means we're called to be set apart. We're called to be holy people. We're called to be different. And Paul highlights that right at the very start because that's what's gone wrong at this moment in time for the believers in the city of Corinth. So to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, just notice that as Paul is going to address some tough issues, he starts by saying, know that I'm bringing grace to you and I'm bringing peace to you. 
So he brings tough messages and tough bits of instruction, but he does it with grace. And I think there's such a lot that we can learn in terms of how we deal with tricky situations in life. I think if we can have grace for other people and we can uh, let our words be gracious as we tackle tricky subjects, then we can get a lot further. And so Paul's posture is, you're called to be a holy people and I'm coming with a heart of grace and love and peace. And in that, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to grow and move forward in Jesus. Then he goes on and says, I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you've been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. In other words, Paul's saying, you actually have everything you need through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the working of Jesus, you have everything you need to be able to live differently. And uh, I just wonder, actually, maybe you're watching this this morning, maybe you're struggling with situations, maybe you're feeling overwhelmed by them. Just had a real sense that God just wants to meet with you this morning and say, I know and I have the strength and the power to carry you through this and bring you to a place of victory. And he goes on, um, he will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So as I say, um, that's just the introduction, Paul set in the scene. It then quickly goes on to addressing some of the nightmare situations going on there. Um, and I think I just want to say straight up, um, sometimes I think we have an unrealistic expectation of church. I said earlier that we come into a room maybe and, and, and expect another 40 mini versions of Jesus, and then we're disappointed when we're not there. And I, I think sometimes we just, um, it, it, it just helps us to have a little bit of a reality check to say every organisation, every grouping, every church will have its downsides and will have its weaknesses because we're all grappling with how we do life in a 21st century. We're all broken people striving towards wholeness. And I think if we have that, we won't, we, um, and I think sometimes we get too quickly disappointed because our expectations are up there. And actually, if we stop to think about it, our ex expectations are unrealistic. And so life can be messy, people are people, so sometimes church will be messy because we're dealing with messy situations. You know, the most common uh, metaphor for the uh, church in the Bible is a family. God's building block for society is a family. And that's a great picture um, quite often to think about, certainly if you've had a positive experience of family. But let's have an honesty moment here. If you think about your own family and particularly when you start to think about your wider family and your broader family all of us have got dysfunction or difficult people in our family and if we translate that metaphor of family over to church the reality is every church is going to have its dysfunction every church is going to have its difficult people every church is going to have those people that we don't find it necessarily easy to walk with and the question is, okay, facing that, appreciating that reality, how can I get hold of Jesus and contribute into that family to help it get better, stronger, and grow? Because that's actually what Jesus calls us to. You know, it's, it's, um, you hear of it sometimes, don't you? People wanting to disown their family. You know, let me just run away. But the reality is, even if you physically separate yourself from the family, you don't separate yourself from the family traits, the background and the baggage. And actually, freedom and wholeness doesn't come from running away from our family. Freedom and wholeness comes from facing up to the issues. Number one, facing up to the issues in our lives, because it's never, in any dispute, it's never always the other person's fault. There's always something that we will have done wrong, or there's always something that will have been uh, flushed up to the surface, even if it's just my reactions to someone else's mistakes. There's always something I can learn from it. And I think if we're going to grow in Jesus, we always have to have that mindset of, God, here I am. What can I learn from this? What do I need to 
um, recognize about myself. What do I need to repent of? What do I need to say sorry for? What do I need to ask you to work by your Holy Spirit to bring change and transformation? So number one, we need to, uh, need to be willing to own our own stuff. But number two, also, um, we need to invest to make the family better. You know, I'm really sad when people walk away or give up on the church because I think everyone loses. You know, they lose the value of a family and we lose the value of their contribution into the family. And uh, the gospel, Paul writes, the gospel is a gospel of reconciliation. And uh, my heart is that we have a church that is willing to own the fact that sometimes life is messy. We have a church that's willing to own the fact that we are broken, vulnerable people trying to become more like Jesus, but we're on a journey towards that. But we're a group of people that will be committed to working through our differences and, uh, and will seek to bring Jesus into the middle of all of the issues going on, that we might grow. And as I say, that is exactly the issues that was going on for the church in, in Corinth. And I say, o over these next few weeks, we're gonna look at some corker of issues, I tell you. We're gonna look at divisions and cliques, which is one of the things that was going on. The church was full of divisions and cliques, and uh, one person saying, I follow a, a, a Paulus, another person, I follow Paul, and, and kind of groupies around different church leaders, when actually the church is meant to be one, and everybody's meant to be included. But that's a massive question for today, isn't it? You know, you look at society around us and society is full of cliques and loneliness. And if we're not careful, we can just bring that way of thinking into church. And then we end up with a church that's full of cliques. So people don't feel like they belong. They don't feel that they're loved. Nobody includes them. But that's not what Jesus is all about. Jesus came, the son of God, um, you know, came for all people. And, and he didn't just die for the good ones or the nice ones. He died for everyone. And uh, Jesus did so well at uh, bringing a most unlikely group of disciples together. That I think nobody else probably would have dared to, you know, two of his disciples called Sons of Thunder. So what were they like in terms of temperament and, and, uh, and personal wholeness? You know, one of them was, was a, a zealot, in effect, a, a freedom fighter. Um, he had a huge range of, of, of people um, in terms of his disciples, but he worked with them, he included them, he invested in them, he even had one that betrayed him, and yet he was willing to journey with him for, for, for three years, and, and I guess if he had repented post that, um, maybe even more in the life of the church. How do we build a church that really does work for everyone? How do we have a heart that doesn't just stick with the people we like <laughs> and know? How do we genuinely have a heart for everyone? And uh, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about, uh, is, is there a place for church discipline ever? You see, and, and I've mentioned this sexual immorality um, that gets talked about. We'll read some passages about that in a couple of weeks' time. But is there a place for church discipline? And if so, what does that look like? And what is the role of discipline in life? Now, we're called, meant to be called, disciples of Jesus. So it's very hard to be a disciple if you're not willing to impose discipline or come under God's discipline and that leadership in a church isn't just there to discipline but it is there to watch over it is there to protect it is there to cover and sometimes it is there to challenge and what are the issues that we should be challenging in church life are we open to being challenged in church life how do we challenge well without just causing hurt and pain and rips and they're great situations for us to uh, think around and, uh, and tackle. Leading on from that, um, there was, there was uh, people falling out with one another. And uh, as I say, taking one another to court. And yet we have a gospel of forgiveness and reconciliation. And people weren't wor working through that. And, uh, and uh, so often you see relational breakdown because we've lost the power and the grace to be able forget, to forgive or face difficult issues and work them through together. It's much easier, much easier, isn't it? You know, you upset me, I get angry, I walk out the room. Diss you once I go outside. That's easy to do, but it's not Jesus-like. And so how do we actually deal with conflict well? 
and deal with conflict so that we grow out of it. And what are the steps and the processes around that? I'm gonna talk a, a little bit about that. Um, another issue going on in Com Corinth is, what does freedom look like? That's a great question. What does freedom really mean? And what does freedom really look like? Because there were people in Corinth and they thought freedom meant I could do whatever I want to and stuff the consequences. But actually, is that really freedom? I think in culture we often have the sense that, that, that freedom is, is I can do whatever I want to do. But actually I think real freedom is being who I'm called or created to be, which is different from just doing everything I'm meant to do. Uh, you know, if God created me and he created me uniquely and he created me as Ian, it's only when I align myself to God's standards and boundaries for my life and I centre myself in relationship with him that I find who the real Ian is. And I think loads of people today don't really know who they are because we've mistaken what freedom really is. You know, a car can't suddenly decide that tomorrow it wants to be a helicopter. It's a car. And a car works best when it's treated as a car. And a human works best when, they're, when they understand that they were made for a relationship with God, that they're made in the image and the reflection of God. So there's good questions about what does freedom look like? And actually, if I'm going to be a follower of Jesus, how can I live in a way that helps other people grow and that protects other people from doing things that wouldn't be good for them? So how can I set a good example to them? What does setting a good example look like? Again, really good questions. Um, as well as, uh, we think a little bit about spiritual gifts as well. Uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, 14 is all about using the gifts of the Spirit. But actually, Paul writes about it because there was chaos in their meetings. And uh, good questions do, how do we use spiritual gifts in a way that love, in a way that enables people to feel loved and that grows people? So how do you give a prophetic word, a word from God, in a way that blesses someone rather than dumps on them? Or, or is unhelpful. And we're going to look at some of those uh, things. And then lastly, we're going to look, um, the other thing we're going to look at is, what does true maturity look like? If you're, if you're assessing, here's someone who, who I aspire to be like in Jesus, what does that look like? The last few years, there's been a number of instances of major Christian leaders falling from grace and uh, finding out that they've been, in effect, leading a double life. How do we protect ourselves from leaders like that? How do we build a better church culture that leaders don't get into that position? And what are the fruits of true godly leadership? All, all of these, I, I think, see, I'm passionate about this series because all of these, I think, are key, key issues for us as a church. And quite often, we don't talk about those things. You know, it's easy to talk about a Bible story and, uh, and, and I don't know, Jesus feeding the 5,000. Great story, we love it. Jesus is able to multiply food. That's fantastic. What does that actually mean for me in my everyday life, though? Because living in the West in London, I am fortunate and gracious and not everybody's in this position, I know. But I don't have to worry about the food I'm going to eat this week. So what is that? It's, and, and we need to make sure that when we're applying the Bible into our lives, we're applying it into issues where we really need help and we're working it through in those issues that really need help. Otherwise, our conversation's always out there and we're, we're being polite <laughs> and, and we're talking about it as if it affects somebody else. But I'm not actually owning what's going on in my heart. You know, one of the translations of the Bible I like is the Passion Translation the Passion Translation. It, it's a pretty accurate translation, actually. It's a good translation, but it puts it in modern language. The message is a, is a paraphrase. Um, the, the Passion is a literal translation, just in modern language. So from a scholarly angle, the, the Passion's slightly more accurate than the message. The message is, uh, I love though, and is really good in lots of ways. But the Passion Translation um, uh, writes uh, Galatians chapter five, in a particular way. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul writes to the church in Galatia and he talks about the, the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit of the flesh. The fruit of the Spirit, he means, when God's Spirit is working through you, the way that, that you're going to uh, live and what a life is going to look like is this. And he talks about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, that kind of thing. Because that's the fruit, the evidence of God's Spirit working in your life. Before he does that, though, he lists the, 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 the fruit of the flesh. So what a life looks like that isn't leaning into God's spirit. What a life looks like that's unrestrained by God's boundaries, uh, set by his word, that isn't open to the spirit of God. What happens if you just ignore God? 
what, what do you get in society? And the Passion Translation uh, trans, uh, it, it, it writes what Paul says in this way. It says this. It says the behaviour of the self-life, in other words, living for our souls and not God, is obvious. And then lists sexual immorality, lustful thoughts, pornography, chasing after things instead of God, manipulating others, hatred of those who get in your way, senseless arguments, resentment when others are favoured, temper tantrums, angry quarrels, only thinking of yourself, being in love with your own opinions, being envious of the blessing of others, murder, uncontrolled addictions, wild parties, and other similar behaviour. Haven't I already warned you that those who use their freedom, quote unquote, for these things, will not inherit the kingdom realm of God? Now I read that list and I think about temper tantrums, angry quarrels, only thinking of yourself, resentment when others are favoured, being in love with your own opinions, uncontrolled addictions, isn't that just the society that we live in? Isn't the truth is the society we live in is a society not governed by anything else than self. And the fruit of that is behaviour exactly like that. And into a culture like today, we need a church that looks different, that is able to shine the light of Jesus. And this series, Messy Church, is about how do we come, become that kind of church that step out of the culture of the day and ask Jesus to empower us to live differently? And we need to grapple with temper tantrums. How do I deal with my anger? Sexual immorality, you know, all of us are sexual beings. We all have a sexuality that we have to deal with and manage. How do we do that in a good way and in a godly way? How do I live a life that isn't all about me? How do I bless others instead of be jealous of them and envious of them and angry towards them? How do I get rid of my jealousy? Have I got an addiction going on under the surface? I'm presenting a good, a good perspective to the world. I've got my makeup on or me had my hair done, but actually inside, what is going on? Or behind closed doors, what is going on? I want us to be a church that is not frightened by the mess of life, that gets the fact life is hard, and a lot of us in our brokenness are in messy situations. But I, I want to be part of a church community that's willing to grapple with those issues, have grace for one another, but then help us get hold of Jesus, that we might see life transformation. So as I say we're going to be looking at some of these issues over the next few weeks. Hopefully we're going to have some great conversations, some great input, some great discussion starters but actually the rubber's going to hit the road not from what I say or whoever speaking speaks. The rubber's going to hit the road when I choose to grapple with how that issue impacts my life and how maybe I choose to work in community with those people around me, that together we might be able to work through those issues so we can live in a better way and therefore demonstrate to the world, show the world a better way to live. Two questions just to finish with really. If Paul was writing to the church today to put his finger on some issues that needed to highlight, what are the issues that Paul would raise today? So if Paul was needing to write a letter to restore, a letter to the church in Epping, a letter to the church in Winchmore Hill, what are the issues that we would want if we're going to grow in our, walk with, our everyday walk with Jesus? What would be the issues that he would need to highlight? And secondly, if Paul was going to write a letter to me, 
It's easy to talk about the church, isn't it? Because quite often, the church, we put a that in front of it and make it a noun and make it something over there. But actually, the church is me and you. It's us together as people, us together as a community. If Paul was going to write a letter and challenge me on the issues that I need to be willing to deal with, what would those issues be? If you are watching this in Epping and you're having breakfast together, (laughs) have a great conversation now about what are the issues that we need to grapple with if we're going to be honest and open and really grow in our relationship with Jesus. I think it's going to be a great series, this. I love, love, love it. I love doing some of the prep work. And it's great to have the opportunity to introduce it today. I'm just going to pray. And, uh, and then I'll see you, certainly in the next couple of weeks. Lord Jesus, thank you that, uh, thank you that you were good. And thank you, Jesus, that you were willing to step into a messy world. Thank you you were willing to step into a messy world with broken people. And thank you when you stepped into that brokenness. You didn't judge and condemn. You loved and you demonstrated grace. And when we read through the Gospels, we see story after story of life change because ordinary people met with the grace and love of God in the middle of their chaos and everything changed. And Lord, I know that life is hard and sometimes life can be extremely messy. But thank you, you're a God who's willing to meet us in the midst of that mess and lead us to change. And Lord, I pray that you'll help us as a church, Lord, to be honest, open, authentic, and deal with the real issues of my life, of your life, of everyday life. So Lord, as we go through this series, Lord, as we touch on some uh, maybe tricky issues, Lord, I pray that you will help us to hear your voice and to support one another to grow more into the likeness of Jesus in your wonderful name. Amen. Thanks for joining with us today. I'll see you again soon.